Hello and welcome uh, to this internet thingy. Um, we are on the part of the RC3, the Remote Chaos Experience. Um, and this is the RC3, uh, the R3S stage, which is the Remote Rhein-Ruhr stage. So um, um, this talk will be about Solitude, a tool for uh, for privacy analysis. And uh, our um, our speaker today is Dan. So um, before we start, a short, uh, a few housekeeping things. First of all, if you have questions for our speaker, um, please head over to Twitter and, uh, and or Mastodon and use the hashtag RC3R3S. The, again, the hashtag RC3R3S on Twitter or Mastodon, the feediverse. Also, um, you can contact our signal, our kind signal angels on rc3-r3s on Hackint on IRC. Again, it's the channel's name is rc3-r3s. Um, also, if you have something that you would like to share, that you would like us to communicate with the, with the others, then please um, contact uh, our news team um, with the email. Uh, with email address newsshow at rc3.world or write them uh, in our blog newsshow.rc3.world. And um, this talk will be translated in German. Dieser Talk wird ins Deutsche übersetzt. Um, ihr werdet entsprechende uh, Links und Anmerkungen in eurem Webplayer finden. Um, should this talk not be available um, uh, for whatever reason, DDoS or something like that um, uh, on uh, on the media CCCDE, then you could try heading over to Twitch or YouTube, which we are streaming to too. So uh, the um, channel's name there is Remote Rhein Ruhr Stage. So search us there, and you will find what you are seeking. Um, okay, so uh, so much for that, and off to Dan. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Dan Hastings. Today I'm going to talk about Solitude, which is a privacy analysis tool. Before I get started, uh, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge my co-author, Emmanuel Flores. Uh, he had a lot to do with this project and is still currently developing it with me, as well as Michael Roberts, who is an advisor to this project. So, uh, like I mentioned, my name is Dan Hastings. I work for a company called NCC Group. Uh, I'm a senior security consultant and uh, focus mainly on web applications and mobile pen testing. However, lately, mobile privacy has been my main interest, um, in particular iOS. This talk and this tool can work with web applications. Uh, however, I will be focusing mainly on mobile, um, as that was the inspiration for a lot of this project. Uh, and you can find me at ubiqu ubiquitous underscore uh, h is my handle for Twitter. So the way this talk is going to work is first, um, I'll talk about why, where the motivation to develop Solitude came from. Um, what does Solitude do? So a breakdown of, of the technical features, um, as well as um, how to uh, demo and how Solitude works and how to use and configure Solitude, because a lot of how the tool works is actually from um, how you configure it. And um, a couple of um, instances of bugs from the wild that involve uh, the pasteboard. So first, uh, actually, there's a talk at 35C3 titled How Facebook Tracks um, Android Users Even Without Facebook Accounts. This is from Privacy International. So they looked at several, um, I think it was like 100 or so Android apps uh, that were very popular and noticed uh, a lot of them sent data to Facebook if you had an account, if you did not have an account or if you had an account. Um, and oftentimes they would send uh, data uh, to third parties or Facebook before you even accepted an in-app privacy policy. Uh, I thought this was really interesting. I wanted to do similar research um, on uh, iOS. And so I looked at uh, a subset of apps, uh, in particular robocall blocking apps, so spam blocking apps, uh, and to see if they were doing similar, had similar behaviors. Uh, and I spoke at the DEF CON 27 Crypto and Privacy Village um, with my talk was titled, Ironically, iOS robocall blocking apps are violating your privacy. And um, what the main goal for this research was just to see um, Apple had put up um, a 
um, they were requiring that you had to have a um, privacy policy if you wanted to get your app into the App Store. And they also had guidelines for uh, privacy policies. And I wanted to see what would happen if I found that there was discrepancies in the data that the app was actually collecting and whom it was sharing with uh, versus um, what the privacy policy actually said. And um, I found out that there were discrepancies in the privacy policy versus the data collection practices. So I brought these to Apple and said, hey, uh, these app developers are not following what their privacy policy says according to your guidelines and brought this to the app developers. Uh, I found that, um, that uh, there was a few apps that sent your phone number to third parties um, as well as um, data being sent to Facebook and third parties uh, prior to accepting an in-app privacy policy. So actually after doing this research, uh, I was thinking and it was it was one thing that came to mind was that um, if you're not very technical, you can't really uh, sort of have any insight or transparency into what happens with your private data when you use a mobile app or uh, a web application. And um, the only way you can actually do this is if you read a privacy policy, which are mostly a lot of times unreadable, uh, or you, you take advantage of laws such as CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, these are ways that you can request access to your data or um, read or view um, in just plain text what your, is happening with your personal data. Um, however, we still don't know, and as we saw with my previous research, uh, if this is the actual truth of what's happening. And the only real way to inspect this is actually if you do an investigation into the app yourself, and it's a bit difficult if you don't have the technical knowledge. Um, so the goal here was to uh, develop a tool that would make it easier uh, so people um, have more transparency uh, into what happens with their private data when they use a, a mobile app. Um, and so most recently in the fall of 2020, um, Apple has now made it mandatory for developers to submit a questionnaire, uh, which then they fill out about um, any data, the data collection practices of the app and um, if any of that data is being used to track you. This is really great um, and even more transparency into um, what happens with your data when you use an app, um, what data is being collected about you. Um, yet there's still no way to verify this. Um, and so using a tool uh, such as Solitude uh, would help in verifying that the data that um, the app developers are providing that they're collecting about you is actually what is happening um, when you use the app. So like I mentioned, Solitude's a privacy analysis um, assessment tool to help um, perform um, privacy assessments of mobile and web applications. Um, the basic high level overview, you take all the data about yourself, your email address, your phone number, uh, and you put it into a configuration file, uh, which is then read by Solitude. Uh, you use the app, uh, the mobile app, the way that um, you normally would, and you input this data, um, and then you'll have a user interface where it's displayed uh, that this, what data you've configured Solitude to search for, um, where it's being sent to, what domains it's being sent to. Um, so. The goal uh, that we had in mind here was to make it as easy as possible to configure and set up. Um, however, you do need some technical knowledge. Uh, you'll have to know how to install Docker, how to run a command from the command line, um, how to install a VPN profile on your mobile device, um, and then also how to install a certificate um, or a profile onto your mobile device um, so you can proxy all your traffic through Solitude. Uh, so the graphic on the right displays how the architecture of Solitude works. Um, so what we've done um, is we've allowed you to run it in two ways. You can either run it just on your laptop um, by itself locally, or you can run it in a Docker container on your laptop. Uh, and the idea, and thanks to Sid, because uh, this was his, um, I used his scripts here to help build this, um, was you run uh, a Docker container, which runs an open VPN server along with Solitude, uh, and you connect your mobile device to the Docker container and then all of your traffic goes through the container um, via the VPN and um, into Solitude and then uh, into the user interface where you can actually view all of this data. So this is uh, an easier way to proxy traffic. It's very difficult with mobile devices uh, to proxy traffic uh, if you've ever attempted to do this. Um, there are ways to do it, but I think this is actually um, one of the better ways that you can do it. Um, and you can also just proxy uh, traffic through um, your standard um, way of proxying um, web application traffic through Solitude. If you run it locally, you don't necessarily have to use the Docker container um, uh, OpenVPN server. So we've built in some features out of the box uh, and we're looking to add more to this. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about those. 
uh, we recursively decode base 64 and URL encoded data. These are two often um, very common data in, um, encoding schemes that you see uh, on the internet um, in mobile and web applications. Uh, if someone were to try to like obfuscate a piece of data uh, by trying to decode it multiple times, say it's a base 64 encoded uh, string that's then URL encoded and then base 64 encoded, and then URL encoded solitude would be able to decode all of these layers and then search for whatever um, data is inside to see if there's any of the strings that you've uh, configured solitude to look for. Um, and we also support protobuf and gzip uh, only at the first layer. Um, so, yep. And then we also have some built-in searches for GPS coordinates, um, internal IP addresses and MAC addresses. These don't um, are not guaranteed to work uh, to find everything. I want to make sure that's really clear. There's some regular expressions that we've um, configured in there that automatically look for GPS coordinates. We've tested several hundred apps and they do work fairly well. You do get some false positives with the IP addresses uh, and MAC addresses, but uh, it's pretty accurate and, and works. Um, the goal of this is it's gonna it's an open source project that hopefully more people will contribute more types of searches and regular expressions uh, so we can find data automatically easier. Um, but for now, configuring it um, yourself is gonna give you the best results or more results, I'll say that. Um, so behind the scenes, we use Yara. Uh, Yara is a way that you can create a rule set where um, you can search for specific strings using regular expressions and conditionals. And uh, it's often used for malware analysis. Uh, however, we've thought that this would be a good use case here. Um, if you don't have the knowledge how to write Yara rules, um, we've created a JSON configuration file, which then converts all of the um, key value pairs uh, that you put in the JSON configuration file to convert to Yara for you. Um, and then also, we also hash uh, SHA-1, SHA-256, and MD5, all of the um, data that you configure in your configuration file to search for those hashes of um, the strings that you've configured. And lastly, we support WebSockets. So um, I'm going to do a quick demo here uh, of how sol what Solitude looks like. So if you look here, this is the web UI. Um, we have a a domain counter as well as a violation counter. And then um, before I show how the UI works in real time, uh, this is actually just a, the JSON configuration file here uh, with all the different types of data that you would configure. You can just open up your text editor and add uh, the key value pairs that you want to search for. Um, eventually, we're going to turn this into a um, settings page uh, in the UI. Um, but for now, you just have to use the text editor to configure it. Uh, and then as you browse your mobile app, um, traffic will filter in in real time um, or uh, of different violations. So what I've just clicked on here is, oops, go back. Uh, this is a decoder object. So uh, if you want to inspect more about the certain request, you can click on um, the decoder object there. And there's a JSON object here, which you can look at, which has um, more detailed information about the request. Uh, so say a piece of data was actually um, encoded, you can look at the different layers of how we've decoded it and search for different strings. If there's um, request data, headers, um, cookies, um, all of that inf information um, you can look at inside of this object. It's for those who want to get more technical and dive into um, what the request structure looks like. Um, you can do that for each individual violation um, of a piece of data that you've configured solitude to search for in the domain it's being sent to. You can click on the decoder object and look at it there. And then here we have like a, a live demo of just a mobile app. Um, just to be very clear, this is not any any uh, like uh, not a vulnerability. This is just a random app that we chose. We gave it access to our location um, and browse the app as we normally would. So this isn't the intended behavior that we expected. I just wanted to use an app to show you how um, what the different types of data we automatically search for and how it's displayed in the user interface, um, like your mobile provider um, and your name and and all of that type of data as well. So that's just a demo of how Solitude works. OK, so types of data that you can configure Solitude with. Um, I mentioned before and showed in the example that you would configure it with a lot of your personal information um, or test data if you just want to use test data, however you'd like to do it. Um, but we suggest, and on the GitHub, there'll be an example, um, probably the same one that you saw there with just fake data that you can use uh, to give you an idea of the types of data you should configure. Pretty much anything that you put into um, a mobile app. When you register uh, a, a new account, 
uh, you'd want to put your password, your username, all in the solitude configuration file. Um, you would want to make sure that you're checking for all types of data. Um, you should not just assume that just because um, your password might not get sent to a, another third party, uh, it's very possible and ha has happened in the past. Um, another thing that we suggest is creating a unique identifier uh, that you can use um, to test uh, messaging apps um, or the pasteboard, which I'll talk in a second. Um, so this is a, a more dynamic string that you want to configure to search for. Um, usernames and email addresses are usually in form fields that are validated. So we suggest um, being creative and creating a unique ID. Um, so having the squid tracer, which you can then put into, say you're sending a message in a messaging app, and that way it's easier for you to keep track of um, the specific data points that you're, you're um, tracing. Um, and then another thing that we suggest that you test for, which I'll talk about in a second, is um, the pasteboard. Uh, if you copy and paste something into an app, um, the app may access the uh, pasteboard where that data um, exists that you've copied. Uh, it's very possible that the app might send that to um, another domain or their own domain. Um, so that's something we suggest that you look for. So speaking of the pasteboard, uh, I'm going to talk about some, um, some vulnerabilities that we found with the pasteboard um, and talk about uh, how you could use Solitude to search for those. So um, the pasteboard is an IPC mechanism um, to share data from one app to another. Um, the real high level basic explanation is just copying from one app and pasting into another. Uh, when you do this, um, the data that you copy um, exists in a, in a place called the pasteboard. Uh, in iOS, it's a pasteboard. In Android, it's a clipboard. They're interchangeable. So I'll be saying pasteboard here because I'll be talking more specifically about iOS. However, you can, um, you can this is transferable also to Android for the clipboard. So the pasteboard often contains a lot of sensitive data. So if you think about any time that you've ever used a mobile app and you've copied something, um, think about that's that's where it exists is on the pasteboard. And um, a lot of the times this data stays on the pasteboard for a very long time. Um, and uh, we can think about all the different types of data we've copied with the copy and paste feature on our phones, such as passwords, credit card numbers, phone numbers, addresses, or text messages. Um, so Apple actually implemented this great feature in iOS 14 where they alert you um, when data from the pasteboard is copied into an app. So in this example here, um, if we copied um, something from Safari, like a link we wanted to share and we paste it into messages, um, an alert would show up um, on the phone that says messages pasted from Safari. Uh, this is great because we there was actually some researchers that found that TikTok, um, every few keystrokes would actually be silently in the background accessing your pasteboard every single time you typed. Um, and TikTok actually fixed this, but it was um, really informative because prior to this notification, you would have no idea if data in the in the pasteboard was actually being accessed behind your back from an app that you were using, like that you had no idea that this might be happening. Um, thought this was really interesting. I was like, this is this is a great feature. Um, if you're unaware that that your your pasteboard's being accessed, uh, you now have that notification that tells you, um, and it's led to discoveries such as what what was happening with TikTok. Um, and however, you still don't know if that actual, if that data, just because the app is accessing the data from the pasteboard, what are they doing with it? Are they sending it somewhere else? Uh, it would be really bad if, if you were to use an app um, and whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, um, silently grabbing data from the pasteboard and then sending it to either a third party or even um, the app servers of that app. Either one would be pretty bad. Uh, and so I discovered that this is actually true with, with a specific class of apps. Um, and unfortunately, I'm going through, uh, or fortunately, the 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 um, uh, disclosure process right now. And so until that's complete, I can't reveal which apps these are until they're patched. Uh, however, um, I discovered that one of the apps uh, I was using when you booted the app, uh, as soon as you started, it would take any data from the pasteboard and then send it to their servers. Um, I think this was just a, a mistake, and I don't think it was completely intentional. Um, and However, that doesn't mean that this could still happen uh, intentionally or not um, with other apps. So what I did was I used Solitude here um, and took a unique identifier, copied it um, from the pasteboard, and then um, used a whole bunch of different apps and then noticed if any of that data was sent from the pasteboard to um, the app servers. And um, like I mentioned earlier with unique identifier, this was in a way um, that I was able to check for this. So 
The new feature that iOS 14 implemented is great. It gives us transparency into when you copy um, in, in, um, something on the pasteboard and if an app had accesses that data so it's not silent. However, you still don't know if that data is being sent anywhere, which could be pretty problematic and kind of scary. Uh, it would be really great if there was an OS level configuration where you actually could disable the pasteboard or even set a time limit. Um, oftentimes we find um, vulnerabilities or issues with mobile apps where they the developers um, allow you to copy a sensitive piece of data from the app, however, they never expire it. Um, and here's a good example of where that data, if it never expires, could be accessed by another app and potentially sent um, outbound. And uh, if the app developers fail to set an expiration date, this would allow you, if you had this OS level configuration where you could actually disable the pasteboard um, or even set a time limit where the data would be completely cleared from the pasteboard in a certain amount of time. So to recap, um, Solitude is a privacy assessment tool. Uh, it's meant to empower people to inspect their favorite apps to see where the data the app collects about them goes um, and to make it easier for them to do privacy investigations into their favorite apps. Uh, and we have a lot of future plans uh, to develop um, for Solitude. Um, one is that right now Solitude doesn't search for any encrypted strings. So what I mean by that is if an app is encrypting data and then sending it elsewhere so you can't see uh, what that data is contained in that encrypted string, uh, it's very difficult for us to search for that. Um, we could do this potentially, but you would need to have a jailbroken device. Um, right now, um, you don't need to have a jailbroken device to use Solitude. Um, but if you wanted to use this feature, you would. Uh, I'm not rec recommending at all that you jailbreak a um, personal device, but you get a testing device that you might jailbreak um, to use for, for doing um, more deeper dives. Uh, we'd also like to develop uh, an Android and an iOS app that you could use that would um, then export all of um, the information on your phone, like device data on your phone, um, to a configuration file, which would then be read by Solitude. Um, so you could actually search for all of this device data uh, and it would be a lot easier to do that. Right now, um, it would be really hard for us to programmatically just keep trying to include all the different types of device data, all the carriers, um, um, MAC address, all this types of stuff. Um, we do search for MAC addresses, but more hardware information um, might be more difficult. So this way, uh, it would be unique to your phone uh, and you could import that configuration into Solitude, which we'd then search for um, any of that device data. Uh, we're going to continue working on the UI. Right now, the configuration for the features that you want, um, uh, for the settings uh, that you want to configure for um, Yara rules or for the um, data that you want Solitude to look for is all done in, in a um, configuration file. So like a, you'd have to use a text editor. We'd like to port this over to the UI to make it easier. Uh, and then lastly, uh, like I mentioned, you don't. It's not required that you have a jailbroken device to use Solitude. However, if uh, certain SDKs and apps are using certificate pinning, uh, then you're not going to be able to see uh, certain traffic and search through certain requests because uh, they will not be uh, going through um, due to certificate pinning uh, or not being sent outbound. And um, if you do have a jailbroken device and you do use Solitude, you can. Um, possibly disable certificate pinning, uh, which would then make it um, so you can see almost all the traffic or all the traffic that's being sent out of the phone. Uh, however, you, you can't really do that now. So for those who are not that technical uh, and want to know if some data did not make it out, uh, it would be great if we could have a feature in the user interface where it would actually say, hey, um, uh, the connection failed to this domain uh, potentially because of certificate pinning. And last uh, is that Solitude is going to be open sourced hopefully by the end of this week, um, probably by the end of this week. And um, you can find the repository for Solitude here. So take note of this. Uh, and it's not live yet, uh, but we will be releasing the code so you can install it and use it um, and contribute uh, and give us feedback. Uh, it's just github.com slash NCC group slash Solitude. And then lastly, uh, I, I have to thank all these people again. I'm sorry if I missed you, but uh, I work with amazing people at NCC Group uh, and, and former NCC Group folks uh, who've all helped me in some way or another. Like I said, Emmanuel is a co-author here. Um, Sid has been a huge advisor. Um, and then I, I honestly could have done any of this without Jennifer Furnick, uh, who is the head of research here at NCC Group. Um, and we have a wonderful research um, wing here and, and none of this would have been possible without her help 
um, and, and all of my other colleagues. So I just want to make sure that they get uh, the proper recognition and thank yous. Um, so thank you for listening to my talk and, and now I'll, I'll take questions. Oh, and yeah, there we go. Thanks. So uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, we did have uh, somehow that there seems to be an issue with your connection on your side, and uh, the, the 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 quality was uh, fluctuating. Um, I hope mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, ah uh, there are some questions. Uh, they uh, the first one was: Is there a link to Solitude? Uh, it's uh, I think you showed it's on your GitHub page. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I just went back to the slide if you're able to see it. Um, it's not released yet, but by the end of the week, we'll have this will be live. Um, so if you want to take this down, it will be live. Okay, so uh, stick to this link. Uh, also, I would kindly ask you to um, to stop your screen share so that we have a chance that you are somehow uh, not a pixel soup. So okay. a person on IRC asks, are encrypted data streams somehow decrypted at the other end of the VPN, uh, example by forcing an own certificate for SSL streams? Yeah, yes. But, um, so we are proxying all TLS traffic um, the same way you would proxy HTTP traffic um, using uh, a HTTP proxy like Burp Suite. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to trust the certificate that's used by um, the, the, we're using um, Midim proxy uh, library. And so you have to trust the certificate for minimum proxy. And then, um, we, yeah, we were able to view all of the, the TLS traffic. Okay. Another person on IRC asks, have you thought about having a standard to define how an app is allowed to behave? I guess Can I'm not entirely sure. Um, in terms of like how it collects data about its users or, um, uh, yeah. Like, um, uh, some some data that I would expect from the uh, like um, I I I haven't asked the question myself so um, and to the person please please feel free to to clarify and the signal angel will relay to me. Um, so uh, other any other questions? Again, you can post those questions over Twitter or Mastodon with the hashtag RC3R3S, or go to our uh, RC page RC channel. RC3-R3S on Hackint. I think the, the, the person on RC could not specify further. Um, as I understand it, as I as I would interpret it, if there mm -hmm. is a, a possibility to say this, this this are things that I expect from the, the from the app to 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 collect. Like I don't know if I have Facebook, it, mm -hmm. I would expect it to 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 have my date my my name. But I wouldn't expect them to have my social security number, for example. Oh, uh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean the way that uh, I guess the the that's what the built-in searches that we're trying to look for. You might, um, I, I think, I might if I'm understanding what you're saying is maybe the app has uh, doesn't have permissions to to collect certain data about you, and you can look to see if it does collect that data. Um, that would be a goal uh, of ours. Um, so you should configure. Um, solitude with all types of data, and then you can test apps uh, that may not ask for those permissions to see if they are indeed collecting that data or sending it mm -hmm. um, elsewhere. Um, and and you can you can look for that sort of thing. Uh, that's where some of the built-in searches come in to handy, and just how you configure the app itself. Uh, okay, sure. So uh, you can look look for it.